Hello and welcome wherever you are in the world, exactly as the young lady just said to us, um, to this, the first of a series of lunchtime webinars that the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group will be hosting over the next six months. My name is Neil Vincer, and I'm the chair of the IOSH Fire Risk Management Group, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce you today, Michelle Pitkin. Michelle? Hi, Michelle. So Michelle Pitkin is my vice chair and Ian Scott. Ian? There's Ian. Um, and Ian is actually the member of the committee who will be leading the webinar today and giving you the presentation later. So many of the webinars um, that we have seen over the past 18 months have centered on subjects that are of interest to the more experienced occupational safety and health or fire professional. However, many of the comments or questions that we've received have come from the less experienced practitioner, either the younger members who are just starting out in the OSH role or others that may have transitioned from another role into OSH. So the series of webinars that we put together are therefore primarily aimed at those who are less experienced in the field. And we hope also though, they will act as a reminder to those who have been in the role much longer. In today's back to basics session, we will start with an introduction to fire safety and cover the basics of the science of fire. So as you've been told, if you have any questions or need any clarification of any of the points mentioned, then please put those questions to us through the Q&A. We may actually cover some of the questions in the later webinars um, because they may be more relevant at that point. But however we do it, we will endeavor to answer as many of them as possible. So basically we hope that you enjoy the presentation. So just to tell you a little bit more about Ian, um, Ian is a, a smiling, so uh, he's a chief scientist, technologist and engineer in the safety of people, places and systems in the built environment. He has 48 years of experience in science, technology and engineering. And during this time, he's worked as an expert witness in forensic science and engineering, mm -hmm. fire and explosion safety, safety of explosives and major risk industries. Also, he has over 30 years in construction and the built environment, as well as marine and aviation safety. Ian will call on this wealth of experience during this webinar. Ian has also held a number of volunteer positions within IOSH, including being a member of the Board of Trustees and serving on the admissions, fellowship and membership, and the research and remuneration uh, committees. Outside of IOSH, he's also taken on a number of roles, including being the past chair of the IOP Professional Standards Committee and participated as a fellowship assessor and interviewer on multiple panels. And believe it or not, on top of that, he has a particular interest in marine safety and supports this through his volunteering with the RYA. Ian, I think you can see, is a truly versatile and extremely knowledgeable person. And it's now my absolute pleasure to actually hand over to Ian, um, and he will now take us through today's presentation. So Ian, it's over to you. Here we go. So welcome, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for the introduction there. So welcome to the, um, the first in the series of modern fire safety presentations. This is um, one of our IOSH fire risk management group principles, number one. It's the introduction and also understanding the science of fire, as, as Neil said. The other principles that we, we share are issues around fire prevention, fire precautions, fire investigation, designing for fire safety, using modern technology, and also there'll be a presentation on an update on fire safety legislation and guidance. So we have about 21 slides in about 40 odd minutes or so now, uh, leaving some time at the end for discussion and also questions. So let's move on. Domestic arrangements we've dealt with uh, before, and if you're, uh, if you're watching the presentation alone, then uh, the usual arrangements may not apply. But uh, let's carry on 
start with the presentation. So if there is one slide to remember, it probably would be this one. There's one slide to remember from today. And this, uh, this graphic is available as a JPEG. Um, it depicts the fire safety wall board, which describes the fire triangle and how to break the triangle by removing sources of fuel, um, sources of heat or ignition, and also uh, sources of oxygen. And as we'll see later in the science or chemistry of fire, we can also break the triangle by disrupting chemically the fire process. Um, the wall board also reminds us of types of fire extinguishers that are available. But remember that there are other fire extinguishers available too. And examples in the old days, you might remember things like the bucket of sand, which was used to uh, smother the supply of oxygen, or fire blankets, which you see these days in, in kitchens and such like, and also sprinklers and uh, fire dampers. So, what actually concerns us? And this graphic just shows essentially three, uh, three aspects of fire that concern us. And the top one, life safety. Life safety is absolutely paramount. Thankfully, fires are rare, but this does not mean that they do not have the potential to cause serious injuries, destroy property or harm businesses. And fire concerns us principally at work, in accommodation projects, as it were, in buildings and offices and schools and hospitals, everyday places where you live, work, worship, eat, entertain people, learn, go on holiday even, recover from illness, at home or in business and commercial buildings, when we travel, airports, railway and underground rail stations, when we go shopping, go to sporting events, go out to the cinema and theatres, and of course in industrial and infrastructure facilities like shopping centres, warehousing, storage and so on. We're also concerned with the consequences of fire, the protection of property, our property, your family's property and, and your employer's property and therefore the ability for you to work or your business and livelihoods to continue. We've mentioned fatal risks. Top risk consequences from any of these other hazards, and they're all, they're all listed there. Um, there are consequences of hazards principally at work and certainly throughout life, where there's a risk of serious injury. And in some sectors, serious injuries are a euphemism for, sadly, deaths at work. When these consequences of this class of hazard have the potential for a level of severity that leads to fatal consequences, we call these fatal risks. Fatal risks are not rare, but thankfully, the probability or frequency of occurrence of these risks may not be that common. In fact, the key word here is the potential to cause ultimate harm. And here we've got the concepts of frequency and probability. And probability can be zero, never, for example, or one, absolutely certain, although it's most often a number between the two extremes. An even chance, for example, is said to be 50-50. And for long-term projects, for example, the lifetime of the building, typically 100 years, um, it's better to consider the frequency of events based on a per annum basis. And that gives us what we refer to in safety as AFR, accident frequency rate, and it's a time weighted value as well. Who are we actually concerned with? Who, who are the people, the people that we're concerned with and involved with? Well, there's ourselves, our families, employees, members of the public, clients of your business, contractors who work for you, pupils, students, patients, etc. And fire is one of the higher risks with patient or student safety, um, such as others like water hygiene or power or personal safety and security in, in buildings. And here in this particular illustration of a, a road salting machine or commonly known as a glitter, the consequences of fire can be strange at times, such as not getting the roads salted in the winter in time. Why are we concerned about fire? Well, here's a, a classical slide. It's illustrating safety performance data. And we now need to look at an expression which I, I like actually very much indeed, 
living with risk and fire safety related data. And this is all for the year ending March 2021. So the population of the UK is about 66.6 .6 million. And I'm, I know there are people on the presentation today from all around the world, but I've had to relate to UK data here as it's the one that's readily available to me. So 66.6 .6 million people in the UK and the number of people employed at work is about 32 and a half million. So in the general population, there were approximately 7,500 alcohol related fatalities, 1,750 road related, 142 fatalities at work, an increase of 29 from the previous year, and 30 fatal falls from height. And now if you look at the fire related data from the same period, and this is all data from the Home Office um, government website, there were over half a million, 518,000, for example, over half a million fire and rescue service attended incidents, of which 151,000 in the UK were fires. That's 29%. Uh, there are 29%, coincidentally, 29% non-fire incidents as well. So the title fire and rescue is, is entirely valid. And within that number, about 42% of false alarms. And of all those incidents, 726 were fires in high rise residential buildings, greater than 10 stories or more. There were 240 fire related fatalities. Compare 142 for safety related as such, and 240 fire related. There were 10 fatalities from gas safety incidents two occupational fatalities due to burns, and one or two carbon monoxide fatalities. Carbon monoxide, of course, being a, a sort of byproduct of fire. Um, carbon monoxide fatalities in the population, although there are 150 or, or so uh, carbon monoxide related non-fatal inju injuries, which may indicate that carbon monoxide detector safety campaigns are actually working. Looking at something a little odd here, this is a rather nasty occupational injury. And uh, if you look at the, the photograph on the right hand side of the screen and also the, the lettering at the bottom, this is actually a, a rechargeable head torch battery. So read the warning on the battery and look at the car keys and guess what happened next. So the car keys are top left and uh, it mentions here that please do not keep your battery in a pocket purse or other receptacle containing metal objects to avoid short circuit. Well, that's actually what happened. The, the guy's head torch battery exploded while he was carrying it in his pocket. Essentially, his trousers caught fire and burned his leg. Um, the battery terminals were shorted out by the, the metal keys, his car keys, which he put in his pocket. And he was taken off to hospital because looking at first aiders, as it were, looking at the extent of the burns, thought there was visible signs of plastic, which had melted, being stuck to his leg. That really, really is pretty, pretty serious indeed. Um, fire safety warnings are put in place for a particular reason. For example, on the label on the battery there, to warn people of the risks of fire, but also design has got something to do with it. So having exposed terminals on, on something, often other examples are laptop spare batteries, for example. Um, and if they do have terminals which could, you could actually get in touch or touch with a, a metal object, then you have to shroud them or shutter them, or in fact, just simply use insulating tape. How do we address concerns? Well, there's a photograph, it's another consequence of fire, but this is not Beirut or Kabul, it's Bosley in Leafy, Cheshire, in the, in the north of the um, UK. And on the 17th of July 2015, four fatalities occurred at the mill. It's actually a wood mill and makes wood-based products from wood meal, etc. And previous advice on dust and fire safety in the wood mill had not been acted upon. So we'll look at dust explosions a little later in the presentation. So how do we address the concerns that we have? 
we act upon all that we can learn from in the series of principles and presentations. We learn from events. We learn about the science of fires, fire prevention, fire precautions. We learn, for example, about fire extinguishers and smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. We learn about the importance of means of escape and fire exits and why it is really, really important to get out of the building when you can and as quickly and as easily as you can. We learn about signage and assembly points. And then we also learn about process safety and fire investigation and designing for good fire safety, fire, fire risk management, including fire risk assessment and sector and industry guidance. In other words, the whole fire protection industry. And from that list we've just read out essentially, the, those are the issues that we're covering in the principles of the work that we're doing. But at this particular moment, hold on to this image in your mind because we'll talk about this a bit later on. So the science of fire. Well, in this part of the demonstration, we're, we're, in this part of the presentation rather, we're going to look at the definition and the science of fire and what it's actually about. So we've defined it in a way here as a study of the physics and the chemistry, life and material sciences, technology and engineering that come together in the transition of ordinary materials into substances that change their state reactively through burning. How do fires occur? Well, this is easily represented by the fire triangle. And what's the chemistry and physics behind the fire and the consequences of things actually burning? I'm sure you're all familiar with the fire triangle. There are several um, iterations of it. Um, people have designed the, the thing in, in different ways, but essentially it's the same principles and processes throughout. We have oxygen, heat and fuel. So here's a bit of chemistry. How do we define heat? Heat is simply energy in transfer to or from a thermodynamic system to another one, other than by work done or transfer of matter. And oxygen and heat are interrelated. One is on the left hand side, the input of the equation, and the other is on the right hand side, where the outputs are listed. So the, the equation there is uh, fuel plus oxygen, is products of combustion, plus heat. We need oxygen, which is commonly supplied by air, and the atmosphere at, at uh, sea level contains chemically about 21% oxygen. So air around us isn't pure oxygen, obviously. There's only about 21%. We need about 14 to 18% oxygen in air to burn hydrocarbons. So typically a small and simple candle, for example, needs 18.8%. Um, and we need more than 10% what's called limiting oxygen concentration to actually sustain life. And there are other gases, of course, as well, principally nitrogen and argon and carbon dioxide, which are actually in the air that we breathe. So what are fuels? Well, mm, that's interesting. There's a myriad of materials that can be used as fuels and they can have many forms. So chemically, a fuel is something that can be oxidized by oxygen, and therefore, when it burns in that process, as we said, as we just saw on the last slide there, it creates products of combustion, principally carbon dioxide and water, and also heat. The photograph here shows flammables with the red diamonds on the packaging, with corrosives and organic peroxides, with are also combustible such as cardboard in, I'm afraid to say, a rather badly designed and provisioned store. But how often do you see this? It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite popular. So what are the means of ignition? Well, this is interesting. We're listening here on the, on the slide, direct ignition, open flame, or used to be called naked flame type of ignition. And that can generate up to say 750 degrees plus easily from, from a simple match like open flame. We talk about auto ignition, where you heat something up to such a high temperature 
that it spontaneously bursts into flame. Smoking materials, I've added a question mark at the end there because frankly, for, for health reasons and many other reasons, smoking is less prevalent these days than it used to be in, in certain places anyway. But also I've put in about vaping accessories now where people use uh, electrical apparatus and battery chargers and, and such like in uh, their smoking accessories. And that of course gives rise to an electrical hazard. We move on to electrical itself and also the, the twin to it, electrostatic hazards. We look at heat, mechanical friction, electrical machines, ventilation, vents on machinery being blocked by dust, for example, and that causes um, machines to overheat and such like from bearing, bearing failure. We look at cooking equipment, toasters, grills, uh, chip pans, but possibly not popular nowadays with the development of oven chips. We look at chemicals, corrosives, principally strong acids. We look at physical uh, means of ignition. Sunlight is a great one, especially sunlight and anything which would act as a lens. And we look at dust and electrical events in, in machinery. We also look at natural means of ignition. Lightning, for example, is a great one, but also microbiological. Uh, microbiological action on, on materials and spontaneous ignition um, as well. In the industrial environment, electrical apparatus is always a serious contender for a means of ignition because it's so prevalent. We rely so heavily on electricity to drive machines and such like, and also some of it can be extremely uh, large power draw on the on the network and system so we've got a tremendous amount of heat potentially available and also mechanical equipment with binding bearings or, or brakes so there's the com combustion process so we've got our fuel we've got our oxygen we've got our ignition energy to get the flame going in the first place to get it started but as the flame burns in air we've got products of combustion coming off and the arrow showing them, them rising there with heat and such like. Um, and we've got heat liberated, of course, from the combustion process. Some of that is what I'll call waste heat. It's liberated from the fire, but also it goes back into warming up the fuel that um, was there in the first place. So in a way, it's a process which sustains itself until the fire is extinguished. So the physics and engineering of fires. Well, this, this looks um, pretty simple and straightforward here. We've got a tank, it's uh, an LPG uh, vessel, and you can see at the top, there's, there's a, a rupture in the tank and a very, very sooty-like uh, flame is burning quite uh, orange, very characteristic um, from the top of the tank with um, an LPG, liquid petroleum gas, within it. It shows us also we've got direct heating, it's the vapour that's given off that's flammable and that's burning away above the tank itself. And from that you get heat that's radiated or convected or conducted away from, from the structure. So all this gives rise to transmitted energy, in other words, also known as heat. And note, note at the, uh, the bottom end of the tank here, the, the frost layer on the outside, uh, indicating the level of liquid in the tank. So thankfully this is sort of burning down and there's not much more fuel in it. But also it tells us about the expansion of materials and gases expanding rapidly and need to be vented from a, a tank of this type or, or use, for example, bursting disks in the processes, um, because otherwise you get um, these boiling liquid um, pressure bursts and, and such like, and fuel in air explosion. LPG is really actually dangerous stuff. So what are the outputs from combustion? Well, the outputs from the combustion process comprise the products of combustion. We've mentioned them before, we've got carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and water. Carbon monoxide is, is generated from the fuel um, within a, a circumstance where it doesn't have enough oxygen 
to be oxidized up to carbon dioxide. Um, the problem, of course, with carbon monoxide is its toxicity because it, it is uh, lethal, really, in, in, in reasonably low concentrations. We've got smoke damage and soot and particulates. Um, we've got the heat that feeds back to the combustion process, and that can physically weaken structures. Now here, this, this is a, a terrible fire in, in a building which is being constructed. And this is one of the most dangerous sets of circumstances in which you can have a building of this type. In other words, it's entirely open to the oxygen in the, in the air. There's a free flow around it. Any small fire which starts will, will have a breeze fanning it from outside, for example. The building is not weather sealed or, or protected in any way. And it's, in, in fire safety terms, a perfect crib, as it were, a perfect structure in which an ignition at the bottom of the, uh, the building will propagate through it really quite, quite easily. Um, I think that's probably going to burn to completion and the whole thing will, will collapse. But also you get scorching of adjacent property and buildings and such like. Um, so you get off-site off -site damage in, in, that, in that way. So the outputs from combustion can be extremely serious and significant. We mentioned earlier about the, um, the Bosley wood mill explosion, and there's a small graphic at the bottom of the screen to remind you um, what damage can be caused in that particular type of environment and you wonder then well how, how does this actually happen and, and what are the other materials that can explode in this particular way well we mentioned the fire triangle at the beginning and here there is um, another sort of version which is a is a five-sided structure a pentagon as it were and we have the familiar content at the bottom with oxygen fuel and heat. So the, the fire triangle, the, the three bits down there. But then there are two more at the top. And one is dispersion. In other words, where you have fine dusts, you really want to get the dust mixed up with air and the oxygen in air and get the fine dust dispersed evenly through a particular structure, particular environment. And then you want to confine it. And if you do that, if you have these five elements coming together, then you're at serious risk of generating the circumstances and the conditions and everything else to, um, to cause a dust explosion. We talked earlier about wood dust. Yes, that's, that's very, much, very much the case. Um, the dust can start to burn. And it's usually the first incident, the, the original burning of it, and there might be small sort of explosions which then raise the dust up into the atmosphere and gives us the dispersion. And it's the second one that causes the catastrophic damage as the photograph of the, the Bosley Mill showed. So if an incident does start, it needs to be suppressed or extinguished as quickly as possible before causing sufficient damage to raise material up into the atmosphere where it can be subsequently uh, ignited by the material burning. Um, some of the others are things in the foodstuffs business, um, baking flour, custard powder and such like. And there have been famous examples in, in history of serious um, explosions in plant of, of that particular type and it has to be suppressed in a way by having uh, venting panels and such like, which blow out and, and relieve the pressure in, in the system before causing the catastrophic damage, which you can see in the small photograph there on, on a particular site. Um, some other materials can burn to what's called burning to detonation. Uh, for example, ammonium nitrate type uh, fertilizers and such like. And therefore, it's really important to never contaminate, confine or combust chemicals which have their own oxygen within the molecule. And we saw earlier on in the presentation that we can get oxygen 
from air, atmospheric oxygen, but also certain chemicals, typically ammonium nitrate, for example, have oxygen present in the chemical molecule, which uh, makes up the material. So in a way, it just carries it around with it. It's got its own fuel, it's got its own oxygen. It's just looking for a source of ignition, some heat or, um, or a, some form of energy to, to get the thing to go. And then when you have um, circumstances like that, you get really very powerful explosions, not helped at all by contaminating it with other fuels, confining it in a structure where it can't burn and uh, combusting it really quite, quite happily. Um, petrol is another example that detonates uh, in cars some years ago. It was known as pinking in the engine where it started to make a rattling noise as the, uh, the engine wasn't running properly. So finally, let's think about some of the bits and pieces that we can take away from the presentation that we've, we've been through today. We talked about fatal risks. So fire is a fatal risk in all walks of life and it, in everything that we do. And I used the expression earlier about living with risk. I think that's really quite important. You have to get your mind around what are the hazards? What are the consequences? How do they manifest themselves? Is it in terms of probability or frequency that I'm thinking that something's going to happen or the project I'm working on, how that's actually going to be uh, managed and, and operated in the time that I'm working on it and in the time that people in the future will be working on it. The consequences of all these fatal risks, of course, are terrible. The consequences of fire really, really are. And we saw earlier about the, um, the triangle where we started with life safety and life safety is paramount. It's the really important thing at the top of the house, as it were. We then looked at property protection and absolutely and utterly vital. That's also associated with and, and linked with business continuity. If we lose the place where we're working, if property burns down and such like, then that can be pretty terrible. People will lose their jobs or their job will be delayed or they can't return to work until the, the uh, place where they work is rebuilt or some alternative arrangements are made. Never ignore fire prevention. Um, the next of our principles, which is up and coming in this, in this series of presentations is on fire prevention. And basically what we're saying there is don't actually do anything or, or, or put at risk the, the chance of a fire breaking out because you haven't been careful in terms of fire prevention, in terms of doing everything you possibly can to avoid means of ignition, to avoid heat affecting fuels and oxygen and such like. And you haven't really taken every care possible. Uh, some of those, some of the care that's taken could be in tidings and, and such like. In, in making sure that um, combustible materials are not left lying around and, and can be ignited by some stray source of ignition. Don't be complacent, that's a good word, complacent. Don't be complacent about fire precautions. So at the very beginning, we were looking at also fire prevention of fire precautions. Fire precautions are the steps that you take if, if, if sadly a fire does break out, how is it handled? How are you going to prepare for that eventuality? And it's around issues like fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors, raising the alarm, having hopefully an automatic fire detection system, an automated alarm within the building. And that raises people's awareness and they say, right, yes, they, they're aware that the alarm, for example, might be tested every Monday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, but this is this is a Thursday, and at the moment it's nearly 10 past one. So this doesn't normally happen. They don't normally uh, test the alarm now. So I must really be quite take this quite seriously. Um, and if if you do think this is a fire, and other people 
uh, thinking the same way, then never ignore any warnings or take any risks. If in doubt, go. And that's a very, very simple um, message to say. On the wall board, on the graphic at the, at the head of the presentation, uh, it says on the bottom about know your fire exit and know your means of escape. So it's absolutely vital to know where you can get out of the building and where you can go to in, in safety and uh, join up with other people at the assembly point and report to the person who's, who's in charge, the fire warden typically um, of that area of the building. Remember the fire triangle and minimize fuel and sources of ignition and be tidy. Yes, housekeeping, certainly in the workplace environment and maintaining um, good stock control of, of fuels, if that's what you're using or materials which have a, an ability to burn combustible materials. Um, knowing where the sources of ignition are and knowing how they are actually controlled. For example, you mentioned electrical safety before. One of the fundamental aspects of this is not leaving electrical apparatus, I'll use the word running unattended. Um, now, clearly, during the working day, for example, that might have to be the case. And if you're working in a production area and you've got machinery running, then, of course, it has to run and the, uh, the attendant can't be there all the time. But what I'm really saying is about leaving equipment on overnight, some of the classics in the office environment are, for example, leaving computer monitors turned on. And I know that it's um, a good environmental or sustainability issue to, to minimise uh, power consumption like that. And also it's very good um, to, to avoid straining the, the air con system if you have one by uh, cutting back on the thermal gain from machines and, and computers that are left running. But it's also the fire risk that really, really is important not leaving laptop computers plugged in and unattended or mobile phones plugged into their chargers overnight while you, while you sleep at home in, in bed. Um, so think about these things and how to, to keep the fire triangle in, in control, keep the sources of ignition clearly uh, accounted for, know where they are, and know how you can actually handle them. Learn the drill find the means of escape. Yes, it's absolutely vital that you understand what to do, where to go, and also how to help people. Taking care, for example, of your family and friends, if it's outside the work environment, but in the work environment with your colleagues as well. And in some instances, your colleagues may need some help to, uh, to evacuate the building safely. And one of the fundamental things there in my earlier comment there about if in doubt, go, is if in doubt, go, certainly, and leave behind uh, stuff that you don't need. Uh, I've seen people go to the, the kitchen area in, a, in an office in a building and go and retrieve what they bought from the, the supermarket earlier and they were taking home for their evening meal that particular day. So they needed to go and make sure they got it out of the fridge. Um, just in case the building burnt down, they wouldn't have to buy their evening meal twice. And then finally, the comment here is, is helping help them, help your colleagues and your family and your friends and everyone else with the knowledge and skills that you have uh, in the fire safety environment. Finally, we've got one more slide. And that's to remind you, it's a don't forget slide that the next presentation that we are going to, to do and Neil touched upon it earlier, um, is on principle number two, the second one of, uh, of six of these principles, and that's on fire prevention. And the next presentation is on the 11th of November at uh, 20, at 12.30, sorry, very fun, on the 11th of November at 12.30, and it's being presented by our colleague, Anne Isaacs, who's extremely experienced in building and, and property safety and is particularly uh, passionate about fire safety and fire prevention. So I think my, uh, my time for the presentation has now come to an end. Thank you all very much indeed for, uh, for listening and viewing 
and such like. And I'll now hand back to, uh, to Neil for a question and answer session. And hopefully I'll see you again someday. Thanks everyone, bye. Well, oh, thank you, Ian. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, and hopefully it sort of uh, got people thinking, well, I can tell actually by the number of questions um, that there's certainly um, a lot of questions being asked. And, and I look forward, hopefully, to actually taking some of you through some, some of those. Um, and actually, hopefully you can, uh, you can see me. Michelle, would you like to join us as well? Okay, so let's, let's start off. Um, we do have a fairly large number of questions that's come in, as we somewhat expected. Um, so we won't be able to answer all the questions, but as I've said to you previously, um, some of the questions you'll find actually will be picked up um, through the, the upcoming uh, webinars as we start um, going through them. So if we don't cover it, please be aware that we will actually try to look at it for you anyway and review it and, and come back to you. Or indeed, we might just point you to the next webinar where we can actually come up with the information for you uh, and make it uh, uh, useful to you. So um, many thanks to those who've actually been answering some of the questions that people have been put up. Um, and uh, it, it certainly helps and it shows actually we do have experienced pe people with us as well. Um, we have a total of nearly 40 which are actually open at the moment. So we're going to sort of throw them in fairly quickly. And let's start with one here. Um, Ian, uh, there's a question from Jim which says, should the dust pentagon be applied to the spread of fire gases as that is flammable? Well, yes. Um, thank you very much for that. Yes, of course. Um, when I actually was, was thinking about these things and putting it together, and I said at the very beginning, the, the point about the fire triangle, there are quite a few iterations of this. And people have actually presented uh, things which are triangles, because you've got three sides, but also in a slightly different graphical representation. And yes, you can actually sit down with a piece of paper and draw out several of these uh, triangles, pentagons and such like. And essentially what you're doing is interrelating the components that go together to form some sort of hazardous or risk laden situation. So yes, you could, you could put in, um, in fuels and dusts and, and other things. Um, you could also, in, in things like bow tie diagrams in, in risk assessment, look at the other side and, and look at the control measures and the, the things which are actually going to avoid the, the top event, the explosion itself. So yes, there's, there's quite a lot to look at and quite a few uh, new ideas here that could be exploited. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, hopefully that's answered the question. Uh, Jakobus uh, asked a question which was very simple. Can you give more info on the flower dust risk? Yes, it's, uh, right. Um, I think actually we we commented also in some of the documents and, and, and research things that we've looked at in the past. So where you have flour, it's an organic material, uh, custard powder, of course, with having materials like sugar in it, uh, has, has fuel inbuilt. It's finely divided. And that's the key thing. It's not simply... Uh, blocks or lumps of material, for example, coal. It's not a lump of coal that, that ignites. It's the fine dust, which is very, very buoyant. It's particularly in, in hot environments. It's risen, it rises up um, thermally. Um, and that provides a very, very large surface area in the air, the oxygen in the air that it's uh, dispersed into and essentially allows a very, very rapid combustion of the material, um, which rise, uh, raises the, the temperature and the pressure very quickly indeed, causing the explosion. Okay, thank you for that. I, I think following that one on, uh, Colin has asked a very good question, which says, are there any significant risks with wool fibers and dust? Uh, he That's works good. in the carpet manufacturing industry, and he's interested in the potential fire risks. Now, yes, I, I would have certainly uh, thought that's a matter of, uh, of some concern and, and some um, some uh, anything anything which can be finely divided 
into very, very small particles of, and fibers which have uh, an element of combustibility and can be raised up into the atmosphere and ignited in, in a fine dusty uh, cloud has the potential to, to rapidly, rapidly burn. And by rapidly burning, um, it's, it's raising the temperature and pressure. It might not be a great overpressure, for example, but unfortunately, if you confine it and, and enclose it in things, um, it can rise sufficiently high to cause uh, damage, damage certainly to property and, and of course harm to people. Okay. So yes, have a look. Well, I certainly hope that's a, that's a help. Um, let's have a look, let's move on to, you spoke about batteries and things uh, during your talk here. Um, Question from Nigel is, I think is a very relevant one, and certainly with the way that, uh, that things like vehicles and things are changing. He said, will we be considering how to risk manage and tackle EV fires, should they occur? As this will be an increase in risk over the next few years. I think it's perhaps a comment. Um, he makes a point that there's currently very limited solutions for this. What's your thoughts on that one, Ian? Yes. Well, one of the, uh, the things that the fire risk management group was asked to do a while ago was to consider um, work which is undertaken by people, especially downstream in the electrical vehicle business. I'm sorry, I use the words upstream and downstream in terms of process safety, but downstream. So where electrical uh, components like batteries are removed at the end of life from vehicles and such like, and um, we did actually uh, we did a review of that and we have actually published a, a sort of web based paper on the um, the future for electrical batteries, lithium metal hydride and, and significant ones. And I'm talking here about uh, not just simple, small, uh, rechargeable ones, but principally in vehicle size applications as well. Um, and modern technology, modern components and materials rather than the traditional lead acid type of batteries, but they certainly do have a very, very significant uh, potential to cause um, fires and explosions. And I think, dare I say this, but I think if you go on the, on the internet and you look at uh, YouTube and such like, there are several uh, examples there where people have done trials and um, even was it Guy Martin did one a while ago when trying to uh, develop an electric vehicle um, based on, I think, a VW Beetle, which was going to shatter world records, but unfortunately it never did. Um, so yes, there are, there are examples there of, of people trying to, um, to set fire to electric vehicle batteries by shorting them out. The modern ones these days have so many, um, use the words carefully, safeguards internally within the system that if you do try and short it out, then there are uh, frangible links and, and fuses and such like. Um, to prevent a catastrophic buildup of very high amounts of power. Uh, some EV systems work on architectures of 48 volts. Some of them go up to 400 volts. So it's a, it's a considerable area. And we are, and certainly in the work which we did a while ago, um, we are hoping to keep an eye on this and see how it, how it goes in case IOSH members come across any other uh, safety related issues with EV batteries. Excellent. Well, I hope that's said. I, I think it's certainly an area that's going to that's going to be looked at more and more um, as we move more and more towards the the electric vehicle as, as we move on. So thank you for that, Ian. Okay. Um, just a well, uh, your your questions are coming in so fast. You're actually beating me at the moment. So. Um, <laughs> Johnny, um, part of your question says, are there any UK statistics regarding fires by human error? Oh, thank you, that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, yes, right, well, that's, that's a fascinating question um, because how do you actually approach the question or more accurately, how do you frame the answer to, to that particular? Um, we have actually, in the Fire Risk Management Group, we have actually published and reported um, on some of the incident investigation processes that you can do. And one of the modules that's coming up in this series of presentations uh, after fire prevention, which Anne is presenting the next, and fire precautions, the next one after that is fire investigation. 
So yes, there are fire investigation techniques um, and the human factors and, and human causes and elements of it focuses hugely, hugely in that. So yes, it's a, it's a very, very significant area. Regarding statistics, that's, that's interesting. Um, the one I've used recently has been the, um, in the UK, it's the .gov.uk website for the Home Office, and they collate all the data from fire and rescue services throughout the country and try and do some statistical analysis on it. Um, I, would, I would say, though, that the answer to the question is probably a very high, significantly large number. And if you think about it the other way around, if it's not by human error or human activity or, or something which is intentional, malicious, and arsonistic, as it were, and criminal damage and people setting fire to things deliberately, then it's probably because somebody has failed to um, operate or maintain a system. Maintenance is, is absolutely key, yes. Operate and maintain. We mentioned earlier about... Um, machinery and dusts and blocking vents and causing bearings to, to fail and such like. And that's also linked to the question by a colleague a few moments ago on wool, wool fibre and, and such like. Um, so where it, spinning looms and such like used to get contaminated with oil and, and fibre. So yes, it would be interesting to, to try and work out some, some value to that. And you'd have to go and have a look, for example, on the Home Office website and see if they've drilled down far enough into it. Uh, surprisingly, it's not on the HSE's radar as such because its uh, stats are seen as, um, or statistics in this area are seen as a home office area rather than an HSE area. But uh, the demarcations of that type are really quite traditional, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's always always a problem. Um, okay. Um... Rianne asks, if you have metal oxides, do they have zero potential to burn as they already oxidized? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much for that. Um, sounds like somebody's a chemist. Yes, yes, you're, you're right. Well, I suppose a metal oxide, ferric oxide or ferrous oxide or rust or whatever. Um, mm, that's interesting. Try, try rusty bits of metal and aluminium. That certainly gives you a igniferous spark. So something must be burning there somewhere. And in one of the training presentations that um, Fire Risk Management Group has, has got together, there are the tragedies. There's one in Hull and there's one in Plymouth. Uh, the one in Hull was the Humboldt Paints fatality. And the one in Plymouth was the um, guy who's cleaning up um, glass fiber molding resins using um, well, steel or rusty metal anyway, uh, scrapers in aluminium drums with acetone and, uh, and a halogen, um, linear halogen bulb lamp and such like. So, yeah, met metal oxides, certainly, um, they, should, they should, be, should be relatively um, innocuous, but I think it's the fact that it can cause igniferous sparks that would sort of suggest that maybe something is is still capable of producing heat and raising the temperature. Okay, thank you. Um, we're coming to the end now, but uh, a question from Paul, I think fairly brief on probably, is there any guidance on self-sustaining fires? In other words, examples around lithium or hydrogen? Yes, there is. The HSEs, um, I, I, I subscribe to the, the, I use the words, the string of events that the HSE sends out very frequently these days. Um, and they've got a working group. There's, there's some aspect and work going on on hydrogen at the moment. Um, and it's all to do with uh, zero Britain or whatever. Um, the thing which is slightly twitchy, of course, is hydrogen is being proposed as a fuel for road vehicles. Um, so it seems to be a matter of the moment, a matter of um, discussion amongst professionals. So yes, yes, um, I, I, would, I would start in that direction and I would go and have a look and see what, 
what the latest research has been in this particular area. Um, because as you can probably imagine, I think it's a fairly corny thing to say, but if it's standing still at the moment, then it's essentially going backwards with the rate of technological change. So if people are really serious about trying to prevent fires in this area or mitigate um, the consequences, then they must be doing research on it to keep ahead of the, the wave, as it were. Otherwise, everyone's going backwards. Okay, right. Um, we it's now um one twenty nine here in the UK, so it's actually time now we have to draw the the Q and A to an end. Can I say thank you to all all the people who are, uh, sort of asked us the questions? But uh, we have nearly one hundred actually been been bought uh, sent to us, and obviously we can't um, go through them all at this point. Some of them I can tell you haven't been through them here. Uh, will certainly be covered in the upcoming uh, webinars. So I would urge you to, to join us for those and actually you'll find them. We will take um, the opportunity to review the questions you've given us. Wherever we can do, we will get answers to get together. And we'll also put together a, a sort of a common question and answers as well, um, which hopefully better help you than some of the, uh, the questions you've actually put to us here today. So it, it actually falls to me, though, to actually close today's session. Um, obviously, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, it's been fantastic to see that we've had participants here actually from literally all around the world. Um, Asia Pacific is well represented. Africa is well represented. Europe, as we would expect, is, is very well um, represented as well. And I hope actually that you find that what we've spoken about is actually relevant to you in your countries as well. It's often a case actually there's great commonality um, between the various workplaces across the world. So whether you're a new entrant to OSH or whether you're an experienced one, and clearly some of the way you've answered some of the questions, we know that some of you experienced and we hope you actually still found it to be a useful um, webinar. And, and interesting and informative as well. Um, thank you for joining us. I need to thank Ian, who's given, I think, a very good presentation. Hopefully um, you picked up a lot from him. Can I thank Michelle, who's been working away in the background, um, answering some of the questions and things immediately for you. And, uh, and you'll see us again when we do other future um, webinars. I must thank Dimple, who is actually the technical support for us from IOSH, who is again working in the background. You can't see her, but she's there uh, and monitoring exactly what goes on. So as Ian said, if you found this one useful, would very much urge you to actually join us for the rest of the series. The next one is on the 11th of November, and we'll look at the subject of fire prevention. So you can see how we're actually building up this into hopefully a, a cohesive um, approach to basic fire. So for me, I could only like to say thank you for joining us once again and hope to see you in November. So goodbye. Bye.